when you look out from sort of a bubble, you don't really see much inequality in your own network, right? Most people, you know, have the same kind of education as you have, same income, same advantages or same disadvantages. So the world looks more equal and more meritocratic than it really is. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Future Frame TV. I'm Elise Grozer, your host for the Inequalities Channel presented by Trace's Dreams. Today, we will talk about social mobility, about the perceptions of inequality and how people explain inequality with their own understandings. To talk about that, I have an expert guest on the program today. Welcome, Dr. Jonathan Meiss. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Jonathan is the Marie Swoboda Curie Fellow at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. He's also a lecturer in sociology at Harvard University in the US. And uh, Jonathan is an expert, as I say, on how people perceive and explain inequality. Jonathan, what do you do? How do you know how people perceive and explain inequality? Yeah, maybe I can tell a little bit about sort of how I got into this research for background. So I felt that a lot of social scientists in their work, they have these notions of what is good and what is bad and what constitutes a problem, what is something they are worried about. And inequality is one of those themes that many people talk about as something that is bad, as something that they're concerned about. But that is the researcher's perspective. And I was much more interested in what ordinary people think, believe, and feel about inequalities. And what I've begun doing is first reviewing everything that sort of we already know from research in social psychology and sociology and political science, all these different disciplines, and then try to make my own contribution to really sort of document how people learn about inequality in the first place, how they come to explain things like poverty and wealth, and how that makes them feel, and when do concerns about inequality translate into like political beliefs? Uh, so those are the kind of questions that I try to do work on. Can you tell us a little bit about how these mechanisms work? How do people first learn about inequality and how do they conceptualize this uh, rather abstract thing? Yeah, so I guess that's a point where I try to draw my own experiences to sort of ask myself, why do I see the world the way that I do? And where does my understanding of inequalities, among other things, where does it come from? And what I found uh, sort of was really informative for myself was things like the neighborhood in which I grew up, the kind of social networks that I was part of as a child and as an adolescent. As a sociologist, I would say the, the kind of social institutions that surrounded me at these sort of formative phases of my life. Like, yeah, again, neighborhood schools, uh, I think are really important. Uh, and a little bit later, who you interact with in a workplace as well. So basically, who did I surround myself with? Who did I learn from? But also, how did that make me understand the whole of society? Because there's no way of witnessing and seeing and knowing everything. So I think many people start from what they have themselves experienced and what they have heard and learned from others around them, people that they're close to, people that they trust. And based on that, they kind of make an inference to try to make sense of inequality more generally. And that process of making inferences based on your social surroundings and the people you know, et cetera, that I think is something that is really important, but not sort of properly understood yet. So that's where a lot of my work is about. And you already mentioned that this is a really interdisciplinary area of study, of course, uh, the cognitive biases that you just described uh, are well understood in social psychology and psychology more general. There has been a lot of research into contextual issues, questions about how we are influenced by our context and how we overestimate uh, maybe our context in relation to the rest of society, right? Do you think this relates to the fact that some people are more worried about inequality than others? Or how come that you start researching this and not everybody else is worried about it? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, to talk about sort of social biases more generally, there's a, just to illustrate 
there's a very yeah sort of powerful theory in social psychology uh, called the fundamental attribution error and the idea is that when things happen to us when we find misfortune on our path we are very quick to understand it as misfortune as bad luck or sometimes as sort of circumstances confronting us that we have no control over but that end up hurting us when we look at other people though and when we're asked why did this person end up being unemployed or why does this person became victim of of this crime we are very quick to instead think about what they did what they did wrong and really individual qualities decisions and choices so we are much more forgiving but also take a much more sort of structural understanding of why things happen to us and are much more individualistic in making sense of what happens to other people um now this is sort of a general phenomenon um but what what i find really interesting is that people people are not the same in this regard some people are are much more likely to apply this sort of this individualistic lens uh to to others uh, uh whereas other people learn that maybe some of the structural conditions that are confronting them are equally confronting other people so this translates into um i think to some extent the kind of world view that people develop and one is a world view where we kind of think of our society as more or less of a meritocracy where good things happen to good people bad things happen to bad people sort of um and where you know rich people successful people deserve it because they got there based on their merits uh, their their talent their hard work their intelligence their ambitions whereas poor people end up in poverty because of failings individual failings right it's it's a very harsh view of reality but i think a lot of people subscribe to this meritocratic belief although what's really interesting is people in different countries are in some countries are much more believing in this than in others and that's one of the things i'm trying to work out why is it that some people really adopt this meritocratic world view whereas other people are much more more critical of it you did some work there that you called the paradox of inequality which relates to this uh, differentiated understanding could you explain what you mean by the paradox of inequality so what i found when i started sort of comparing survey data on this particularly when i started looking at trends in income inequality characterizing different countries but then also trends in beliefs and concerns about inequality and combine those i found some really interesting patterns uh, so generally speaking in western countries we've seen uh, income inequality concentration of income among a small group of people whose fortunes have grown you know much 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 faster than uh, than the rest of society we see that really increasing from the 70s and 80s onwards peaking in the 1990s and 2000s at which point really inequality is sort of higher than it's been in you know about a half a century so it's a big change it's a you know you would think it's a real disruption to these societies countries like the US uh, the United Kingdom uh, but even a country like Sweden has gone through a similar trend right so this is sort of a, a general pattern across western nations but then when you compare that to the the surveys that have been done since the 1980s at various points with citizens of those countries you actually don't see that people are getting much more concerned in many countries there is there's not really a trend it's it's very much stable and in some countries you actually see that people are becoming less concerned um as real levels of inequality are 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 growing are, are increasing so that i think is a is a, is a puzzle Uh, or a paradox and i've tried to explain why that is the case uh, in my work why is that the case <laughs> yeah so <laughs> the million that was a bit of a teaser <laughs> yeah so um basically this goes back to how people learn about inequality in the first place and um what i have um what i argue because you know i'm i'm still trying piecing the 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 different parts of the puzzle together here there's no like definitive proof but this is the 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 theoretical sort of understanding that i'm working with um and that is that people um in these countries that have grown so much more unequal in recent decades um rich and poor people are no longer interacting with each other in the same way as they did in the 70s and 80s 
Um, rich and poor have come to live in different neighborhoods altogether, uh, or when they live in similar neighborhoods, their social lives are like completely uh, disconnected. Uh, their kids go to different schools, they work at different workplaces. Uh, we see that marriage and, and dating, uh, like romantic relationships are more and more based on the level of education that people have and their income, such that, you know, university educated people only almost exclusively marry with other people uh, who have a university education uh, and vice versa. So um, in all sorts of ways, in one word, we see growing uh, economic segregation uh, in all these different realms of life. And that is accompanying the growth in inequality. And what that produces is more or less segregated realities where if you're not university educated, if you don't have a really high income, then you don't have access to the same neighborhood schools social networks as people who do have university education and then high income such that there's rarely any interactions anymore maybe superficial interactions but not the kind of settings in which you can really learn about each other so if that is your social reality then when you look out from more or less sort of a bubble you don't really see much inequality in your own network right most people you know have the same kind of education as you have, same income, same advantages or same disadvantages. So the world looks more equal and more meritocratic than it really is. Cynically, one could say, okay, um, of course, it would be fun if we had interaction, but also, of course, we tend to associate with people that we have something in common with. Uh, so maybe there is not really a problem uh, with people uh, sticking to their kind, or however you want to define this uh, segregation. Uh, what would you answer to, to an objection like that? Uh, is there a problem? So researchers have long sort of understood that networks tend to form on the basis of what uh, network scholars call homophily. Um, the idea is that people kind of gravitate toward others that they share something, they have something in common with. Um, but that what sort of what people had in common used to be things like having the same religion, uh, coming from the same ethnic group, um, uh, sharing same political beliefs. And to some extent, those are still important factors. But what's become more and more important in who people interact with, who they date and, and eventually marry if they do, um, is their income and their education levels. So that means that your kind of socioeconomic status in life uh, tends to be uh, the same as the people that surround you. Now, that, that leads to a concentration of resources um, where some people have a, a lot of access to resources and other people don't. So that may be a problem in its own right. But what certainly is, a, uh, is, a, is, a sort of, is relevant to, to my own work here is that when we see that sort of that kind of network formation uh, where people almost exclusively have friends with same levels of education and income, that really leads to um, uh, a, a, a biased and uh, sort of twisted worldview. Because when you then look around you, you see this really weird sort of selection of, of the whole of society from which you draw all sorts of conclusions that are just not true. For, uh, for for most people in your society. So I think it makes you see things from a vantage point that is just really unrealistic. And that becomes a problem if, for instance, your political beliefs are based on what you know and who you know, how can you feel solidarity with people that you have no sort of awareness of? And how can you you know, form your political opinion about something like inequality when you don't see any of it in, in your own network. There is a question about empathy here as well, right? I mean, if you, if you want to relate to somebody, it's easier if you actually see something of them or learn something uh, of them. Uh, but I'm wondering also how this then relates to uh, the question that you mentioned before of uh, social mobility. Because if we only observe our own context and that's fairly stable, what makes us think then that there is a lot of social mobility when there really isn't? Yeah, so I think that people underestimate mainly, well, they underestimate both how much social mobility is possible 
um, and you see that in many surveys, people just think that society is a lot more sort of fluid um, than than it really is. Um, societies um, in, in the Western world, but also in, in Latin America, for instance, tend to be very sticky at the bottom and at the top, uh, meaning that wealthy people have sort of a higher chance of, of staying wealthy over generations than of than of dropping down and the same is often true for people who find themselves on the sort of lower rungs of the of the social social ladder um, and i think there's i think a lot of our belief in mobility comes from comes from meritocracy because meritocracy uh, as sort of a uh, an idea of how society should function for many people has become an idea of, of how society actually functions. Um, so sort of our, our, our ideal has become our assumption of how things work. Uh, and, and this is, again, this varies, right? Some people are much more skeptical of this than others. And some people in certain countries are uh, compared to people in other countries. But um, I think there's a lot of meritocratic messaging that, that reaches us through um, things like policy documents, government memos and such, but also in, in our popular culture. Uh, I think a lot of TV shows and movies uh, basically try to sell us uh, on the idea that a hardworking, talented people, a person can, can you know, do anything they want, anything they set their mind to. Um, and we see that in reality TV shows too, like whether it's, uh, what's it called, I, pop idols or, um, you know, Mexico got talent. It's it. You know, these shows really sort of foster the the idea that all it takes is talent, and 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 you'll make it, right? Which is just evidently untrue. So that brings me to the question. Uh, interestingly enough, you said that uh, there are large differences between countries, right? And obviously also between individuals. But the interesting thing is, if uh, there is a country dimension to it, there must be. Uh, specific factors that that uh, beyond maybe the, the the story of meritocracy at large uh, matter in how people perceive uh, inequality, but it also matters then, or it also implies then that these views can be changed. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you could say something about the country specific factor, and uh, as a follow up, then how can we change people's views to be more according with reality? Yeah, that, no, those are those are great, but also difficult questions. I think um, the the country sort of perspective, it has a couple of different parts. So one is the extent to which um, government is sort of expressing these meritocratic beliefs and popular culture in a given country is sort of selling us on meritocracy. I think that varies from country to country and place to place. Uh, I think they um, at, those messages are particularly strong in a country like the United States where they really align with the, the, the concept of the American dream uh, or, or the idea that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Those are all expressions of the same kind of meritocratic worldview. Whereas um, in, uh, in other countries that has become, uh, people are much more skeptical about that. So for instance, the whole the concept, the word meritocracy actually comes from from a number of um, different sort of scholars and authors in the 1950s, Hannah Arendt used it, um, but the most, the most probably well-known sort of originator of the term was, was Michael Young, uh, who was an important figure in the Labour Party in England. And um, he wrote this book called The Rise of Meritocracy, which was a dystopian piece of fiction. It was... Um, it masqueraded as sort of a, a history telling uh, that went all the way to the year 2047 or something like that. Uh, but it was actually written in the 1950s. And he, he was sort of projecting a, a future where everything would be perfectly meritocratic uh, to, to show just how cruel a world that would be, a world where um, you could not be discontent, you could not complain, you had no reason to feel aggrieved if you were, you know, down and out in the gutter because um, you you deserved it. Um, like this notion that you know, rich people are rich because they they uh, they deserve it, and poor people are poor because it's, it's very damning. 
and of course it 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 comes you know it comes with all sort of difficult uh, questions when you start looking at intergenerational mobility and other things right like because parents of course pass on their advantages to their children so how do we think about those are those meritocratic are those deserved do you deserve having wealthy parents who give you a head up you know sort of a leg up in life so he was grappling with all of those difficult questions and and so for the english public um, meritocracy as a word has a, a much more critical connotation than for for an american audience and for other uh, people who have kind of forgotten the origin uh, of that of that term. So I think that's one thing that varies from country to country. But the other thing that really varies from country to country is just how segregated economically countries are. Um, so, you know, we see the extremes of gated communities uh, in, in some countries and places where people, you know, have literally erected the wall uh, between rich and poor uh, to sort of keep them separate. Um, uh, so I think that's an extreme case. I think in the United States, you see uh, economic segregation expressed as people living in more downtown areas, urban settings versus more suburban that are that that are often more, um, you know, more affluent. Uh, so so there's that kind of geographical segregation. But in in a country like like my own country, the Netherlands, I think we don't really see that same kind of spatial segregation. We don't see gated communities uh, much if, or if at all, but we do see um, that social lives of, of relatively affluent and less affluent people are you know, almost, almost entirely disconnected. So people may see each other on the street, uh, but don't really interact. And they certainly are not likely to be friends and not likely to, to date, marry, and, and become part of the same families. So I think the extent to which that change that varies from country to country, and how much that has changed in recent decades, as levels of inequality have grown a lot in some countries, a little in other countries, not so much in other countries. I think that also is a really important part uh, or piece of the puzzle. Now, your second question was about how to change beliefs, right? Yeah. So um, that's where. We, we've seen a lot of um, attempts of of, uh, of of scholars who I think most of them have some sort of concern about the fact that people are misinformed about inequality. Uh, but of course, it's also just an interesting theoretical question of, of what, um, how can you affect belief change? And it's a question that's becoming really, really um, current in the context, for instance, right now of um, vaccination skepticism, right? So uh, many countries are, are really encouraging their uh, their citizens to to vaccinate, but uh, in 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 many places, uh, some part of the population is is very skeptical, and all sort of people, physicians, you know, government policymakers are trying to trying to change people's minds. Um, so how does that work, and how do you accomplish that? It's like it's almost like um, you know, it, it's 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 the, the the million dollar question. What scholars have done, scholars in the field of inequality beliefs, what they've tried is to say, okay, I'm just going to give people the facts. I'm just going to tell them, this is how much inequality has grown in your country, or these this is these are the chances of a wealthy person, um, or a person who grew up in a wealthy family uh, themselves growing up to be wealthy. You know, like these kind of things, we, we, we have so much information about this from our scholarly work that we can we can package it, uh, make it presentable, and we can share that with people. So what what these kind of studies do is they they um, randomly uh, assign uh, and present this information to to one group of respondents, whereas another group of respondents doesn't have access to that information or has access to different information. And then they see. Does this lead people to um, perceive more inequality or um, understand the causes of inequality differently? Right, that that sort of individualistic or structuralistic view that I was referring to earlier, or you know whether people explain inequality as more meritocratic or as uh, as, as not meritocratic at all. Uh, and also, uh, are people do people then become more supportive of forms of government intervention? Like um, income re redistribution, or more investment in uh, welfare programs, or those kind of measures. Um, and 
yeah, the findings are a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, I think in, in many cases, when you present people with factual information about inequality, on average, people become, uh, well, they, they come to perceive more, more inequality when you ask them um, afterwards. Some people grow more concerned after they learn about inequality. Other people don't. Uh, there's some interesting cases where people actually became less concerned because it sort of it seemed to when you give them the information, it seems to normalize it in some way. They're like, oh, oh, this is how it is. OK, well, then I guess I'm not. Then I guess it's normal. Um, and when you start looking at whether people then come supportive of government intervention, that's where it kind of really falls apart. So a lot of it seems to be, you know, people who are already on the left of the political spectrum are more supportive of government intervention, which they already were. People on the right, not so. Um, it, in some cases, there's there's no effect whatsoever. It, it really varies from, from study to study. So it's hard to, to generalize from those. So I would say um, it may be part of an approach to, to change beliefs, but just giving information is unlikely to really sort of solve the issue of, of misperceptions. Can you personally imagine a future without meritocracy and how would that look like? I mean, basically, I'm referring to if people knew about these things, how would that change our approaches? I mean, I think we, we very much live in a present that is not a meritocracy. Um, but um, in terms of how people believe uh, society works, yeah, what I, I guess what I would expect to see um, just like we saw a couple of decades ago, when when people are not sort of completely disconnected and segregated based on their income and based on their education, um, when when we, for instance, um, find ways to create public spaces where people could meet, people from all backgrounds could meet, um, when schools are are not segregated based on how much money you have, but are actually sort of sites of, of, of economic integration. Um, I think when um, when that is realized or, or when society becomes less and less segregated, I think that provides an opportunity to people to learn about the lives of others, um, to hopefully feel some empathy uh, toward others, um, but, but certainly to have a much more realistic understanding of the society that they live in um, as well as of, you know, their place in that society. And from that, I think we would have a, you know, political conversation that really starts from a much more realistic premise of how the world works uh, than what is currently often very biased vantage points. Jonathan, before we come to a close, uh, what, is your, what is your outlook for your own research? Um, now that you know about these things, what is what is there left to know for you in these subjects? Oh, there's there's a lot to know still. Um, so, for instance, I think the, the the question of belief change still requires a lot of uh, a lot of work. One thing that I started working on with a group of colleagues at uh, the London School of Economics is something called deliberative focus groups, where we um, rather than sort of give people the facts. Um, as they are filling in a survey online or, or or on paper, what we do is we bring people together, people from different backgrounds that don't necess- that don't know each other, and we sort of facilitate a conversation where people uh, share their views, exchange ideas, and then in the middle of that conversation, we present them with some facts about about inequality or about social mobility, and then we try to sort of see what happens to the conversation, uh, not. Uh, what happens when you give people, you know, sort of shove it in their face, but when it becomes integrated in a really interactive process. Because I think a lot of ideas, a lot of beliefs, uh, we don't form them in isolation. We form them in our conversations with um, uh, our, our our colleagues, our, our friends, our, our, you know, in, in, in the fights we have with our family members. I think those are really, really informative. So I think that could be a much more effective way to, to think about um, a belief change or, you know, sort of doing something about misperceptions. That, and that's what I hope to, to pursue in the future as well. Another powerful uh, reason for, or, or argument point for interaction and uh, 
social interactions in general, but specifically with people that might be different from ourselves, right? To uh, get a better view of, I mean, more complete view about how the world functions, but also a broader view of the different realities that different people face. Jonathan, thank you so much for these insights uh, on social mobility, on segregation, and how these issues relate to inequality. Thanks for uh, sharing your personal position on meritocracy uh, with us and, and the listeners. Uh, and thank you all for watching another episode of Future Frames TV. If you like these topics, if you want to learn more about inequality, please join us again next week for another episode. I'm Elise Crozer, your host on the Inequalities channel, and we hope to see you soon. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.